Welcome everybody. Um, my name is John Roberts. I'm a board member with the Center for Election Science. Um, and welcome to hear this discussion about um, how to judge voting methods, uh, which is a very critical topic. Uh, and to have this discussion um, uh, about how to judge voting methods, we're going to have with us uh, Michael Ravinsky, who is a board member of the Center for Election Science as well. And uh, answering these questions, he'll be interviewing our esteemed executive director, Aaron Hamlin. And uh, so with that, with, I'll just leave it to you, Michael, take it over. Great. Thank you so much, John. So yeah, we're going to have a talk here. This will be mostly Aaron uh, probably doing most of the talking and I will be chiming in with uh, things like, wait, what? Um, and uh, we, uh, I'll try and keep an eye on the questions and on the chat for, for questions that come up uh, related to what we're talking about at the moment. I may not see that. Um, John will try and keep track of all the questions so that we can have time for questions at the end if we don't um, get to things uh, as we're going through. Um, we usually have really, uh, really knowledgeable people on these calls, people with, uh, uh, who are really interested in voting systems and know a lot about the technical aspects of voting systems. And then we, we uh, I think, also have people who are not nerds, uh, whose interests are more, uh, you know, maybe more less technical and more social and uh, interested in sort of how do I, how do I make things happen in my community? Uh, so I think we can, uh, I don't think we need to shy away from getting really technical in this, but uh, if it gets too in the weeds, I might, uh, Aaron, stop you and say something very polite, like, you know, give it to me an English nerd. Um, and with that, um, let's, let's jump right in. I, 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 let's start by, I'll say that um, when I talk about voting methods with people, I will often say, just flat out say, you know, plurality voting is one of the worst voting methods and approval voting is one of the best voting methods. So uh, uh, why, like, how would you, how would, how can I get away with saying something like that? What are the criteria we would, we would start to, to be able to uh, judge a voting method on whether it's good or bad? Uh, sure. So I, I think one starting point that um, we have on our site already that is nice just to kind of reference in general, and I'll uh, put it in the, the chat window, which is an article that we have a while back uh, called What Makes a Voting Method Good? And uh, there's just really the kind of the introduction to the concept of, okay, you, you have this thing, uh, this, uh, this tool that measures support, takes, out, takes in information, and then uh, provides a result in terms of selecting a winner, uh, given some number of candidates. Uh, so like, given that's what it does, it has all these things that are involved into it. And so uh, what that lays out is these factors for uh, how we evaluate a particular voting method. Uh, and when you take a peek at that, you see uh, some of them like, uh, for instance, uh, simplicity, ease of administration, um, whether it elects a good winner, uh, whether it actually captures candidates' support uh, in an accurate way, whether the method itself is tractable, uh, and then kind of looking at it from a, a global uh, perspective. So those are the kind of um, kind of the main <clears throat> the, the main factors that we're looking at here. And we can kind of dive into each of, each of those factors individually and perhaps apply them a bit. Yeah. So let's start with with let's start with what's a good winner. How do you know if something's if someone's a good winner? So that's probably one of the more interesting and, and, and challenging ones uh, of, of, the, of the bunch. Um, so there are a number of ways of looking at that. Um, so, um, uh, and one of the challenges is not every voting method has had its day in the sun in terms of being able to uh, conduct elections. And so when we're looking at this, we can use things like computer simulations, uh, we can look at game theory, uh, we can look at polling data, and to the extent that we can, we can look at uh, real world data. Uh, so for example, like with computer simulations, there have been a couple approaches that have been uh, uh, done in the past. 
Um, one was by uh, a mathematician, Warren Smith. Uh, in 2000, he had done uh, a computer simulation comparing different voting methods. And then um, more recently, a few years back, uh, a former board member uh, uh, independently conducted uh, uh, a similar analysis comparing different voting methods. And, and, and here, like some of you may have like heard the term uh, computer simulation and thought, well, like that's, uh, that's a, a bit to kind of unpack there. Uh, so I right. how do you simulate what people want and how do you know that that's, that that is, that is reflective of the complexities of, uh, of, of real, of the, of real people. Absolutely. And, and, and doing a computer simulation is, is challenging. So you have, so th the way that these are traditionally done in this context is you, you create this, uh, uh, these electorates. Uh, so like we call them like agents within a model and you make certain assumptions about them, such as like the distribution of their ideology, their preferences, and then you put, um, uh, you create candidates uh, in the space, this political space, and they make decisions uh, based on optimizing uh, their own personal utility, given whatever voting method that they're using. And you can kind of move certain dials. Uh, and some of these dials can be how tactical the electorate is, um, how many candidates there are in the, in the race, uh, and, and other factors. And the nice thing about this is you can take a method that hasn't been uh, really used anywhere, and you can create elections for it and run these and run these elections millions of times under different scenarios. Um, so that's one of the uh, perks of, of this uh, of this approach. What's the advantage? What what sort of measurement can you get if a voting method has been used in different places? Like what what further what what metric, met, metrics can you get from that? Uh, so if a voting method has been used uh, in different places, so when we're talking about real world data, it can still be a bit challenging. Um, so uh, for example, like say we had just like a traditional choose one voting method election, a, a normal plurality election, and it's a three candidate race and we suspect something uh, like there's some vote splitting from maybe a third party or independent uh, candidate. Um, but like unless we collect actual data, it's very, it can be challenging, like even in something where it's kind of suspect, like, but we don't really know, it can be kind of challenging to look at that election and say, well, would a different voting method have created a better result in this particular scenario? Uh, because in order to be able to answer those types of questions, you need to be collecting more, more data. So, so the mere fact that, and another thing to keep in mind is that even if we're using another voting method, the mere fact that that voting method selects a winner uh, isn't necessarily cause for, for celebration. We need to be taking this extra information in in order to assess whether a voting method did a good job within a particular scenario. And there are some ways that we can do that. So uh, for example, uh, CS in the past has done uh, polling uh, alongside uh, major elections. So we did, did this in 2016 and we had done this also leading up to the, um, during the democratic primary in this 2020 election. Um, and we can run these polls alongside uh, actual elections and, and we can do what's called like a within subject design which is when we ask the same people that we are that are respondents within this poll, and we ask them, well, how would you vote with this method? How would you vote with this method? How would you vote with this method? And in addition to getting that information of like a direct comparison between these respondents on how they would vote between each of these methods, on top of that, we can also ask them, okay, for, for this question, I want you to just give me an honest answer, regardless of viability, how do you feel about this candidate? Like how much do you want them to win, say on a scale of zero to five? And we can also ask them to provide that information in a rank order as well, using this kind of honest assessment control measure. And that's not something that's really common. Like we haven't really seen that in the past, uh, but it's really these tools that are necessary to be able to bring in more information and get a better assessment of these methods. So basically it's complicated. I, I imagine that I imagine we could also look at things like uh, what percentage if you have a voting method that's been used for a long time and look at what percentage of people actually vote, for example, if it's a high percentage, it might indicate that people are happy, you know, about the process of going to the polls or something like that. Yeah, voter turnout is, is interesting, but I think it's, uh, this is kind of a, a tricky one because like kind of 
it, it gives you this feel good feeling when everybody's coming out uh, to vote. Uh, at the at the same time, however, if we think about it in kind of a, a nerdy statistical point of view, uh, so like all the time when scientists go and they do sampling from some larger population, they don't need to take a measurement from every individual within that population to be able to uh, get a good prediction of what that uh, population thinks about uh, thinks thinks of as, as a whole. So the, the number of people turning out doesn't necessarily uh, indicate um, uh, a, good, uh, a good result because you could have say like a, a terrible voting method where 100% of people turn out, but you still get a, a terrible result there. What, so, one thing- talking, So I'm just looking at the chat and there's questions about sort of like, what is a better result? What's a terrible result? So uh, that's sort of the, that's sort of what we're trying to get to here. Yes, about how do you define whether it's a good result or a bad result? So, so when we're talking about this factor of winner selection, uh, one of the, the big factors in like what makes a, a voting method good out of, uh, out of other factors, uh, what we're talking about is what voting, voting method maximizes uh, voter happiness uh, to the greatest extent. Um, and so like kind of going back to those computer simulations, uh, what they can do is they can look at the uh, uh, the utility that a particular candidate uh, brings them, and then if that particular candidate didn't win, how far off they got, and on uh, given all that information, uh, which candidate winning brings the maximum utility to that electorate. And if a particular voting method uh, didn't select that candidate, how far off was it, and how much utility was lost? Uh, so when so when we're using these computer simulations, uh, that that's what we're looking at. And if we're looking at actual elections and say doing polling alongside it, we can do that same kind of thing using these control measures and saying, okay, well, this was the best candidate in term of, terms of having a high utility winner. Which, which candidate actually won? Uh, what, was, what was the electorate's utility for that candidate and, or, or happiness for that candidate? And how far off was it in terms of who actually won and the, the actual winner who would have made uh, voters the happiest? So, uh, great. So moving on, let's maybe move on from sort of voter happiness and what makes, uh, what, 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 what makes the voters the happiest. What, what other, there are other conditions that, there, there are other factors of, uh, of elements of a voting system that could, you know, arguably make it a good voting system that are, that are separate from that. That's right. Um, such as uh, um, how well it measures support for example, for not just the winner. So obviously every voting method produces a winner and you can argue about whether or not that was a good winner or not. But you know, uh, there's also a question of, it's very useful to know how much support a particular candidate had, how much support, you know, someone, not just as someone won, but, but some sort of measure of like, how much do people actually like this person? And additionally, how much support do people have for the other candidates as well could be very useful information for the next election for people considering running and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something I think is kind of overlooked a lot. Um, so so when, when you're looking at, at, at a race, and we could see it like, for instance, in, in the 2020 primaries recently, um, there were a number of candidates uh, under this choose one voting method that we're using where it looked like they hardly got any support. And it's a reasonable question to look at that and say, like, really? Really? Like, did, did they, were, were they really uh, that unpopular? Or was it the voting method that just wasn't capturing their support? Uh, and when we look at this uh, through kind of uh, more sophisticated data and actually taking that, that data to begin with, uh, we can answer that question. We can take this control measure of, uh, that asks people uh, how much they would like to see a particular candidate be elected regardless of the viability factor. We, we can take that measure and then superimpose that on top of the actual reflection of support that a voting method got. And we can see what that discrepancy is. So we see what the voting me method measured and we can see what this control measure looks at and says, well, this is the actual uh, support uh, and look at that discrepancy. And when we do that uh, with different voting methods, we can see um, like varying degrees of discrepancy. So like uh, approval voting, uh, for instance, not only does it do a good job in terms of maximizing voter happiness, uh, it also does a good job gauging that support as well. Uh, the same thing with a lot of uh, 
uh, rating systems like range voting uh, or virtually any voting method that uses a type of range voting instrument when you're scoring candidates on the scale of say zero to five. Those also tend to do a good job in terms of capturing candidate support in addition to getting a good winner on top of that. Um, interestingly, there are some methods, some uh, ranking methods in particular um, can find this challenging. So for instance, if uh, we look at uh, ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, for instance, it does uh, an okay job uh, at electing a good winner, kind of uh, maybe leaning negative to so-so um, in terms of, uh, of getting a winner that maximizes happiness on average. Uh, but it does actually does much worse than that on uh, capturing candidate support, for instance. Uh, and uh, one you know of the who ways- won. You know who won, but you don't necessarily know why, and you don't know if that means that everyone really liked them or if just they're just the best of a bad lot. So, so the, in, in, in this uh, scope, the, the struggle is being able to figure out the measure of support or the amount of support that other candidates got who didn't win, for instance. Um, so uh, say like we're looking down the line uh, with the Democratic uh, uh, primary and we're looking at, at, at folks like, um, uh, uh, like say Andrew Yang or, or, or other candidates that had like their own kind of, uh, show of support, uh, but they didn't show up very well. Uh, when we look at these uh, same polls, like including other organizations that have done done these polls, and we look at how these candidates do under say ranked choice voting, even if we look at it in the um, best possible light for that particular voting method, uh, which would be looking at the candidate right before they were eliminated. So ranked choice voting, it simulates a sequential runoff of rounds. Um, and so we can look at how much a candidate support how much support a candidate got right before they were eliminated, which is like their maximum support for that voting method. Even if we look at it with that best possible light, we see a really large discrepancy between uh, what that candidate got, who, who lost, uh, but still needs their support reflected, how much that, that candidate got in support compared to say a control measure. And we see a pretty wide discrepancy there, which tells us that this voting method isn't doing a very good job of capturing and using the information in an intelligent way to be able to tell us how much uh, voters support these candidates. It's very difficult to look at ranked choice voting results and have a sense of what happens. I mean, it's quite complicated to, to sort of look at all those results. There's not, there's not sort of a clear metric you can point to for a candidate to say, this is, this, this, to this, this is an, easy, an easy representation of something. One of the things that we had done with the Democratic primary results was, and, and this was also as a way to try to be able to make direct comparisons, which can be a little challenging because you have these different voting methods, they take different types of information in, and but you want to be able to make a direct comparison, so you try to make the, the metric that you're using as parallel as possible for, for these comparisons. And when you look at the figures that we had done there- Sorry, which comparisons are you talking about? Uh, comparisons of support between different voting methods. Uh, so, so like, and with ranked choice voting, you have ranking information, approval voting, you, you have these uh, approvals, you have other type of cardinal information uh, with scores with other voting methods. And you're trying to uh, take these and put them together in a way that you can make comparisons between these. So you, so you can see, okay, well, is this how much support this candidate got under this method compared to this method over here? If you're comparing apples and oranges, it makes it a, a little bit more challenging. So we want to try to, um, create the same kind of playing area or, or, or metric as possible. Uh, and the way that we did that with the Democratic primary was uh, we looked at um, uh, how much support that they had uh, with these, like the first choice rankings for them uh, before they were eliminated, but at the same time, after they got all the transfers as possible uh, before they were eliminated to so like their, their maximum support. Uh, and when you look at a, a tabulation, uh, table for ranked choice voting, um, the number that we would show uh, for a particular candidate, like that would be their, their max support. And so that's the way that we were able to compare these different voting methods with support. And even like with the max support, like these candidates were, uh, uh, were really uh, missing out a lot of support compared to these control measures with that particular voting method.
And it wasn't necessarily the same with other voting methods, like approval voting did a great job in terms of measuring that support, as well as other scoring methods. Of course, our choose one voting method did its normal terrible job in terms of capturing that support. Right. Um, encouraging people to participate, it's like encouraging, encouraging candidates to jump in the race if they have you don't like how things are going and you want to you want to fix things and you've got an idea uh it seems like that's a good that's a good measure how 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 easy it is for someone to to jump in and and, and participate without being fear for example afraid of being a spoiler yeah yeah so i i think there are a couple of factors that go into play here one is that that's that spoiler dilemma so it's not fun for anybody to really fulfill their democratic duty, and then uh, get thanked for it by uh, being yelled at for, for being a spoiler and causing a worse candidate overall to win. Nobody wants to go through that as a candidate and also uh, as a voter, like no one wants to be shamed by their, uh, their inner circle uh, for voting honestly, um, and then being told that they were uh, a schmuck or, or being called names for uh, trying to vote for the person that they felt aligned with them yeah. best. And so um, having a voting method that doesn't create that kind of dynamic is helpful for encouraging new candidates to run because then they don't have to deal with all that. Uh, the second component is um, in terms of encouraging candidates, candidates to run is getting that reflection of, of support. Uh, because if, if you run, even if you're not getting shamed, uh, if you run and you're getting like 2%, 3%, it's uh, it's a bit demoralizing in a can as a candidate and isn't going to encourage you very much to uh, to run again or to keep your campaign going. And it's not going uh, to encourage other candidates later to take up your cause. That's exactly right. So, so it may be like uh, every candidate that, that runs isn't going to win. Uh, even candidates do well, like they don't always win every time. Uh, but if you come into the to the playing field, you've got good ideas and you have a voting method which is able to uh, capture that support or that enthusiasm from the electorate and getting behind your ideas, uh, then your ideas can get some traction. They can get co-opted in a way that just wouldn't be able to happen uh, without that reflection of support. It seems to me like uh, scalability may also be an important factor. Like, is there a do we reach a point where there's too many people in the race or do we want a system that that is flexible enough to allow anybody to jump in and sort of handle a large number of candidates. In, in terms of uh, the number of candidates, so in terms of the, uh, the number of candidates, one of the things to think about is the interaction with uh, ballot access laws. Um, so in general, we want that, uh, the, the barrier to entry to be uh, kind of low. Uh, one of the things that's nice with approval voting is that it works well with the number of with a large number of candidates uh, in a race. Uh, say there are, uh, we're just using extreme. Say there are like twenty five candidates uh, within a particular race, uh, which isn't totally outlandish given the the primaries that we've had in in the past. In California, in our primary, in our last Senate Senate election in the in the open primary, we had 37, 37 people running. Yeah. One. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the, the nice thing with approval voting is that if you have a long list of, of uh, candidates there, it's not terribly uh, more uh, terribly like uh, demanding mentally in order to go through that 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 list with approval voting compared to say the way we're normally used to going about uh, evaluating candidates. Um, but like when, when we're thinking about the kind of and this gets into a little bit of the uh, uh, simplicity or complexity uh, factor, which is looking at a candidate list and how challenging is it for the voter to be able to use this voting method and assess a long candidate list. So it's, it's, it's uh, I, I agree. One of the things I love about approval voting is that it is scalable to any number of candidates. All you have to do is just go down the list once and say, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, no, no, as opposed to Okay, what's my first choice? Okay, now what's my second choice? Okay, now what's my, and if you have like 37 people running, um, it's not so simple. That's right, yeah. Particularly, so uh, when we're thinking about different ways of, of doing it, um, there, there are scoring uh, methods that have you score each candidate. Um, that's 
uh, it's, it does provide more information, but there is more cognitive uh, effort there uh, as you're looking at each candidate in terms of uh, figuring out like how to evaluate each individual one and say like you have a list of like 20 plus candidates. Um, and it can become even more challenging with a ranking, for instance. So one thing to keep in mind is you don't necessarily uh, have to provide uh, an assessment of each candidate with these other voting methods. So uh, some, some places even truncate their ballot so that um, you can only provide a certain number of rankings even because uh, by allowing you to rank all of them, it would make their, their ballot a mess. But still, like even if we're doing that, what we're by say, voters just saying like, ah, that's too much, I'm not gonna do that, or we're truncating the ballot, so we're not allowing them to provide the information. Uh, we're, we're losing out on the information that would be able to help us optimize the outcome, as well as be able to uh, capture that support for these, uh, for these candidates. So it's kind of like, well, like do, do we take a method that is, has a complicated element in terms of how it allows voters to express the information? Do we go ahead and let them express all that information anyway? Or do we try to simplify it, but at the cost of simplifying it, lose out all this information, possibly get a worse result, or, um, or, or and uh, not be able to capture the support for all these candidates, uh, even the ones who don't win, so that we're not able to say, see whether they have good ideas or um, help them get the information that they need as they're uh, deciding whether to run again in the future or to try to build their party or, or, or something like that. So you wanna use a voting system that's scalable that allows for, for whatever it's going to encounter so that you can, you, can, you, can, you can continue using it without making it worse by truncating the information just to make it simpler. That, um, that, yeah, that's right. We've talked about uh, a little bit about sort of being easy to understand, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a quality you've talked about. Um, what else? Uh, I'm thinking ease of implementation, perhaps. Yeah. Well, with the kind of the ease of, of understanding, and we could talk about the uh, implementation, but with, sure. with the ease, like the, the simplicity component, as well as the um, uh, the complexity component, it really has two parts there. Uh, one part is that expression element, and then the other part is understanding what's going, in, uh, going on in that black box in terms of how that calculation is, is taking place. Um, so we can talk about like that part within the complexity, or we can talk about the uh, implementation. I'll let you take the lead in terms of where you'd like to steer us. Um, uh, cover, cover, cover before implementation. Uh, the implementation. Sorry. I uh, you said the implementation. No, the ease of understanding. Okay. Um, so with the ease of understanding, um, uh, this is keeping in mind like the other part of the voting method. So we have that expression element, all kinds of ways of expressing information with the voting method, uh, choosing one, choosing as many as you want, uh, ranking, and then using that ranking to simulate pairwise comparisons. Uh, simulate sequential runoffs, all kinds of things you can do that. And then with uh, 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 scoring information, you could like take an average, take a median, um, you can uh, mix and match and use sort some of the scoring elements and then uh, use those scoring elements to imply rankings and do different types of pairwise comparisons there. All kinds, so what I'm getting at there is all kinds of complicated things that you can do with the information that you're providing. So. Um, when we think about the component of uh, what you're doing with that information. So with the normal way that we think about uh, voting uh, with just choosing one, one candidate, there we're just talking about simple addition. Um, we're just adding things up. And the same thing with approval voting. So you're not uh, uh, adding any complexity to the calculation element with approval voting, you're just adding things up. Um, with say, uh, uh, range voting, uh, when you're scoring each candidate on a scale, say zero to five, um, same thing, you're just adding things up. You can also take the average. Um, one tiny bit of complexity there is that if someone doesn't score a particular candidate, what do you do with that? Uh, the simple approach there, there are different approaches that you can take, but one simple approach is just uh, considering that candidate as being scored as zero. That's kind of the simplest approach to that. Um, with uh, uh, ranking methods, say like uh, 
Condorcet methods. Uh, with that one, you're taking these rankings and then you're saying, okay, well, this candidate was ranked higher than this candidate and this head, head pairing on this ballot, uh, this candidate wins. You do this aggregation with all the ballots to be able to simulate these head-to-head -head elections or head-to-head -head, um, yeah, elections between each candidate and seeing which candidate is able to win uh, more head-to-head -head elections than any other candidate. Uh, and that's and the candidate who's able to beat everyone head-to-head -head is called your Condorcet winner. Uh, and so Condorcet methods uh, address it that way. And then you've got like these tiebreaker elements within Condorcet methods, which adds this other layer of complexity. You get into things like uh, uh, Schultz, Smith sets, all these other complicated things. Not even okay, going to talk about them. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, so, so the, uh, what, I, what I mean when, as you, as you, as you talk about all these things, so what I, what I, what I'm sort of thinking is, well, so there's a question of how detailed you can get and how much information you can grab and how specific and detailed you can be about measuring what the voters actually want. But there's probably also some sort of uh, important element of how, how happy, how, how comfortable is an average voter with what's happening and how well do they understand it and, and you know, because it's one thing to just, you don't, you don't really want a system where, where it, the measures will be going really well and ask them really, really complex questions. And even if they're willing to, willing to sort of say that, they might still come away feeling like, well, you're telling me this is, this is who the winner is and you're telling me this is what I wanted, but you know, do I, we, we want a system where you don't have to trust the people who are doing it necessarily to, 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 to do it right. You know, you don't want a system that just says, yeah, trust us, it's too complicated for you to understand. That's right, particularly like when we're thinking about like and kind of this stage and history in terms of where alternative voting methods have have come uh, and what people are used to in terms of the uh, of the of the complexity. Um, there's also an idea of diminishing returns with the added complexity that you're adding. So like we've talked about some of these other factors like uh, how good of a job a voting method does in electing a winner uh, and how like how much that satisfies the electorate. Um, and then there's also that capturing of support uh, with, uh, with different voting methods. Uh, and sometimes, sometime, but not always, uh, adding a little bit co of complexity to a voting method will be able to help on those other components. Uh, sometimes, however, uh, by adding additional complexity, it may technically improve those other factors, but it does so at a high cost. And so you have to balance, okay, well, the how cost much of like people not participating, people people giving up, people not showing up, people not filling up whole ballot. Uh, a high cost of complexity. Uh, so uh, so if um, say you, you want to improve these other the other measures, but like even with say like approval voting and something like range voting, you're already doing really well uh, overall in terms of how these are performing and selecting a winner and measuring candidate support. Uh, but if you want to try to add, uh, to make that even uh, uh, better, like you start to add extra layers of complexity and you have to start to think back and think, okay, well, am I really getting my return on investment for the, the complexity that I'm adding? Uh, or is what I'm doing here uh, already doing good enough in, in terms of the goals? And also thinking like these, these things, like if we're talking about it in the real world, we want to get these things implemented. Uh, and we want to be able to do so with a high success rate and be able to have it to uh, be able to gain the, the traction necessary to spread over to other places. So this isn't just like a one trick pony uh, for a particular community. We want something that can, uh, that can move and is easy to adapt. Um, but when you start adding these extra complexity measures, um, you start to run into this kind of question of like, well, like, Am I really getting the return on investment for this complexity that I'm adding here compared to using this really simple uh, approach uh, that already does really well overall? I imagine it's complicated by the fact that people are different in the amount of complexity they're comfortable with. That's right. The yeah. amount of complexity they think is worth it. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, we've got, so it's, uh, it's almost 440. We probably should go to questions maybe in like five or 10 minutes. Uh, sure. There's some, is not, not quite yet though, John. Is, Aaron, is there is there's, uh, other stuff that you wanted, you thought we should cover about um, things you want a voting method to do versus, or possibly things you don't want a voting method to do? Um, 
so maybe some other components just to kind of um, just kind of to touch on. Uh, one is like ease of administration with the particular voting method. So, um, and this kind of gets in with uh, tractability a little bit as well. And here we're thinking about things like, does it need special software? Um, uh, does it require complex ballot design? Um, can you, um, uh, does it need extra components? Like, do you need to have all the ballot data centralized? And then is there a good method for doing uh, what's called risk limiting auditing, which is being able to take a sample of ballot data and being able to uh, look at that sample and see whether um, it was off for the official tally. And you can um, you do that statistically figuring out, okay, well, what are the odds that we would get this result uh, from this particular sample overall? So, so there, there are ways to- You're talking uh, about that's a way of uh, checking that the results are probably uh, weren't tampered with? That's right. Uh, and the voting method itself, like the different voting methods have different protocols for uh, risk limiting auditing. Uh, and so one of the things we, when we're looking at different voting methods, uh, it's helpful to see whether there's a protocol in place that's workable, how much of like how difficult it is to actually implement it uh, when we're thinking about the voting method, because the voting method interacts with all these elements and somebody's got to run these things at the end of the day as well. So can we you, just have to keep in mind. Can you give an example for a particular voting system of an, of a, an audit system, whether it's a, 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 a simple one or a, or a not simple one? Sure. So the current way that we uh, vote is pretty simple. Um, so we're just choosing as many as you want. Um, there uh, you would take... Uh, in, you, uh, the current, you mean choosing one? Correct. Yeah. Choosing one candidate. Uh, there you would take a sample of, of ballots, say you take a thousand of them, uh, and you look at them and you say, okay, um, uh, this is the breakdown of candidates that we got. Uh, we can do some statistical analysis and uh, look at uh, competence intervals for where we would expect the, uh, the true number to be in given the sample. And if the actual tally is within that range, we can look at it and say, yeah, oh, it seems like it's within reason. If it's outside of that, that range, uh, we could say, well, like, I don't know, we need to keep, and then you just keep sampling until possibly you sample and go through the entire uh, 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 ballot data. Uh, so that that's, a, that's, a, that's a simple way of auditing. That's right. And yeah. that would be the same for approval voting. Uh, that would also be the same for approval voting. Uh, you do have some sophistic more sophisticated approaches that you would have to do with ranking methods like ranked choice voting, although there is a protocol in place um, for risk limiting auditing for rank choice voting, although it's much more challenging. Okay, is it more challenging for range voting as well? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of there being an explicit uh, uh, methodology in place for risk limiting auditing for range voting, uh, but given the type of uh, tallying uh, that takes place there, uh, I would imagine it's somewhere in complexity between um, like approval voting and uh, say, um, ranked choice voting. I, I can't imagine it being as complicated or more complicated than ranked choice voting, given the type of tallying that you have involved. Do you want to touch a, a little bit on, um, and we don't have to, but about uh, ways of ensuring that a governing body is, uh, the diversity of the voting population is reflected in the diversity of the governing body? Uh, sure. So, so which I don't know if that's necessarily a subject for a single winner, which, 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 which we're talking about single winner elections yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it wouldn't be, it would be, it, uh, so uh, if you want to make sure that a particular uh, uh, electorate is represented within a governing body, uh, you're, you're pretty much forced to use a multi-winner election uh, that uses a proportional voting method. The, it's really without, it's really outside of the abilities of a single winner method to be able to accomplish that. When you have a single winner method, um, you're, best result is going to be getting a particular candidate that maximizes the happiness of everyone. If we imagine, say, like a normal distribution within the electorate, uh, it would be that candidate like right in, in the middle. Uh, but it wouldn't be someone that's able, even if we imagine different types of distributions, it wouldn't be, um, uh, the, the candidate would be unlikely to uh, appease people uh, more out on the ranges. You're only getting on one ranges. person. You can't, you can't get, you can't get someone who represents yeah. everybody when you only yeah. have, you know, if you want 
maybe you get someone with like a split personality uh, disorder or dissociative identity disorder. I, I don't know, but yeah, you, you're pretty much stuck if you're looking at single winner. Sure. Is there anything I've, I've uh, missed that you wanted to touch on? Um, let me see here. Uh, so perhaps one other component would be um, uh, tractability. Uh, so there uh, we might look at... Um, what, is, what is tractability? Uh, so tractability, looking at the uh, likelihood of a voting method to be able to, uh, to catch on uh, uh, given uh, an attempt uh, within a particular governmental election. So there we might look at um, things like credibility, so whether it has like an academic underpinning uh, to it, to, to, so we can see whether it's uh, 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 certain aspects of it are predictable, um, what its track record has been in terms of uh, passing with, uh, with ballot initiatives, uh, whether there are practicality components with feasibility, which uh, interacts to some extent with administration, um, so in terms of, of practicality. Um, but that, that's one component as well in terms of thinking about um, whether it makes sense to go with a particular voting method is whether it's tractable uh, in, in practice. So whether or not something will catch on. But uh, is that actually is that actually a quality, is that actually a, a useful quality for a good voting method is whether or not it would catch on? Because I suppose a bad voting method could also catch on, be easy to catch on. And that That's right. Not be yeah. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, an example of an excellently, uh, a, a voting method that is excellently in tractability is our current choose one voting method. Uh, it's done a great job. Uh, it's used everywhere and it's caught on real well. Um, and so, uh, but th that, that also goes to say that uh, just because a voting method does really well in any one particular factor um, or even multiple factors, uh, we have to look at these factors as a whole uh, in order to be able to assess, uh, like particularly from an organizational standpoint of uh, where do we put resources behind? Uh, because ultimately at the end of the day, uh, resources are limited uh, and uh, we uh, may do ourselves a disservice by saying like splitting the vote with uh, allocating in kind of multiple pools. Um, good question. I see one question. Let's just end with this and then we go, we'll go to more questions from John. Um, it, it, Colin Weaver says, is there, any, is there literally anything good about first past the post other than that we are used to it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we can always, yeah, there you go. It's uh, very, very easy, uh, easy to fill out, even with a long candidate list. Um, it's uh, easy to calculate, just add those numbers up. Uh, easy to administer, like they, they do it all the time. Uh, although there are some unforced errors in terms of ballot design, uh, but that's not the voting method's fault. Uh, uh, so uh, very tractable, as we uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, it uh, kind of bungles the job completely in terms of selecting uh, good winners, uh, as well as measuring candidate support. Uh, and Really, uh, and, and that's interesting too, because you can see, like here's an example of a voting method that does really well on certain factors. Uh, super easy, uh, it's shown to be tractable, very easy to administer, uh, but like, boy, is it terrible at choosing a good winner, uh, and particularly in any kind of like moderate to a heavily complicated election, and also Geez, is it really doing a bad job in terms of capturing candidate support? Uh, so unless, even though, unless you can make sure that there are only ever two candidates, in which case it works perfectly. That's right. And uh, there, there are some, uh, uh, we'll, we'll call them smart legislators who have uh, uh, figured that out by making ballot access laws really challenging uh, so that it, in, in some jurisdictions, uh, you have a de facto uh, two, two candidate race. If a candidate doesn't run, um, how do you know that, uh, I'm trying to think of some sort of like a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if it's outside of the voting method, if it's outside of the system, if you're presented with two choices and you vote for one and one of them wins, how do you know there's anything wrong if, if, there's, if you, don't, you don't know who didn't run? The, and that's, uh, although we're talking about that kind of, uh, you bring it up kind of rhetorically, like that, that does create a, a real issue because someone may, may look at their elections and say like, oh, you know what, you, you keep talking about these complicated elections when you have all these candidates run, we never have other candidates run. Uh, and then never okay. thinking about the causality of that, like, you, do you ever think of 
maybe why you don't have other candidates run. Maybe it's because you have a voting method that disincentivizes candidates to run in the first place. Cool. Um, I think we could go to questions. John, do you, do you want sure. to take it? Take it? Yeah, here's, here's a question about metrics, um, Aaron. Uh, someone asked, what about the distribution of voter happiness? In other words, uh, what if aggregate voter happiness by some metric like voter satisfaction or whatever, let's say that a single number that voter satisfaction could be quite high, but we wind up with one segment of the population that's really, really much less happy uh, with the result. Would, would you say that that's a good result? And how does that impact voting methods? Yeah, so it's, uh, so you can do modeling with different types of distribution. Uh, so a lot of models use a normal distribution. You can assume a lot of polarity and say, uh, uh, do these models over a bipolar distribution uh, with like kind of two humps. Uh, but even, even with that, like at the end of the day, you got to pick somebody. Uh, and in terms of uh, getting a good winner, um, like if you have uh, two, uh, uh, like a bimodal distribution there, um, there like technically the candidate uh, who is best for everyone would be someone in, in the middle. Uh, so like you're kind of forcing everyone to take a middle ground. Uh, uh, so like even with different types of distribution, like that candidate in the middle, uh, you can, if it's kind of a skewed distribution, like you'd have to take that into account, but like normally that's what we're talking about. Um, so even in those cases, uh, you have to think just at the end of the day, uh, a single winner uh, method is just not capable of appeasing everyone. And so as a consequence, uh, you, uh, the maximizing uh, voter happiness is really the, the best that uh, you can do. So, so that's okay. an argument for a proportional representation for having yeah, combining yeah. districts into multiple districts so that the, the sort of the smaller passionate group has a better chance of having at least one person in there who represents them. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, so uh, there are some um, circumstances when you have, you're just kind of stuck. You, you inherently have a single winner uh, election like mayoral, governor, uh, races, that kind of thing. Uh, but when you can uh, have a multi-member uh, election uh, and you have a, a multi-person uh, body, um, that's when you can use the proportional method. And there you can acknowledge that, okay, uh, we have a diversity of people within our electorate, lots of different ideas. If we wanna be able to acknowledge them, um, then we have to use a multi-member system uh, that uh, uh, elects people in a proportionate way in order for uh, multiple views within the electorate to be acknowledged. Okay. Um... Here's another question about rank choice, uh, uh, easier, maybe it's a different question, but uh, why does rank choice do a poor job of capturing accurate support for all the candidates? How common are rank choice voting weaknesses? Or do they occur once every hundred times or once in a thousand times? <laughs> so so there, there are kind of two questions mixed in here. Like one is like the anomalies that you see within ranked choice voting in terms of selecting a winner. And then the other part is that capturing of support. How common is it that it messes up in terms of capturing support? Uh, with the first part, it depends a bit on uh, the complexity of the, of the race. Um, so one of the things that, and, and here I try, to, I try to throw methods a bone like as much as I can. Uh, so uh, there was um, a race in, in Maine where a Republican, I believe his name is Polquin, um, got really upset uh, that uh, ranked choice voting um, didn't elect him, even though he had the plurality of votes in the first round. Um, you had an independent in that election, uh, and that independence votes, her votes transferred over to the, the Democratic candidate in that race. Um, and when you look at it from that perspective, um, you have kind of a small time spoiler there, didn't get much support, and you have a pretty simple transfer over there. It, in those cases, it really does make sense. Like, it, it looks like right choice voting, given the information that we have, it looks like it did a good job there. Um, and so when you have these kind of small time spoilers, it seems to do an adequate job there. The challenge there becomes when you have a more complicated race, you have a bunch of people in the election, and it's kind of close, uh, and those um, it can, not necessarily always, 
but it, you, you can see these issues where um, you, uh, you get vote splitting in such a way where a candidate has uh, broader support, but because they're not getting as many first choice votes within a particular round, it can unfairly knock them out. And as a consequence, you're eliminating really solid candidates that are ultimately better than the candidate who wins. Um, and so, so uh, 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 and then there's the other part, which is the, um, the measuring of support. And that's something that actually ranked choice voting does consistently poorly. Uh, and we can look at this using uh, research that we've done firsthand. And you can also look at uh, ranked choice voting advocates. So when you look at their polling, um, you can see the reflection of support for uh, a longer candidate list, particularly in the Democratic primaries. When you look at those, you can you can see that if you look past, like say, like the first uh, three uh, candidates or so, you see these other candidates they get just like hardly any amount of support, and you, it doesn't look uh, terribly far away. Oftentimes, from uh, our current choose one voting method of of, uh, of voting in terms of the support that they capture, and there are some reasons for this. One is that uh, well, there are two components. One is something inherent with the uh, measurement instrument. Uh, which is ranking. So ranking in statistics, they call this an ordinal measurement. And what, what that is, is that when you have, uh, say, first, second, third, the distance in uh, an amount between first and second isn't necessarily the same distance between uh, second and third and, and, and these, other, uh, these other intervals. And as a consequence, it's, uh, you're kind of getting some sloppiness within that measurement. And you also don't have a clear threshold in terms of where that order of rankings is, where you're seeing satisfaction. So like, are you satisfied third, fourth? Like maybe, uh, but you just don't know that, that that measurement instrument doesn't capture that utility component. Okay. Yeah, and and yeah. like one, one more part, one more sure. part in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, reflection of support under ranked choice voting, uh, aside from like the, the raw measurement is the calculation component. And that's where um, and the reason this uh, ranked choice voting loses so much data within the calculation component is that um, it, it's only looking at first choice preferences at any one point in time. So even though as a voter, you could have ranked all, all the candidates, all the voters could have ranked all of the candidates. So you have all this data there. Um, but if you're looking at uh, candidates who make it later uh, in the rounds, uh, and you can see that they've ranked other candidates, uh, well, if those other candidates that they've ranked have already been eliminated, even though the voting method captures that information, it's never been reflected in the tally at all. And as a consequence, you're never seeing that show up. So that's the okay. more complete answer to your, to your okay. question. Sorry about that, John. That's no, okay. <laughs> um, here's another question. You mentioned the spoiler effect uh, with respect to ranked choice voting, but more generally about metrics for measuring the quality of a voting method. There was a question which method best eliminates the spoiler effect? So I'm, can you imagine what, what's a metric that would measure uh, to what degree there is a spoiler or the risk of a spoiler in an election? Yeah, so, uh, the, so the spoiler effect is when, just uh, for clarity, is when a candidate runs, uh, they don't win, and yet they cause someone else to win who uh, wouldn't have won otherwise if not for their presence in the race. So that's kind of a, a complicated but uh, explicit definition. It, it, it also is kind of has, has an overlap with another uh, criterion called independence of irrelevant alternatives, which is an irrelevant person coming in, changing the outcome of the race. So there's a lot of overlap uh, between those two. Um, so uh, there, like cardinal methods tend to do a good job there uh, overall. Um, but in terms of uh, um, like a particular voting method doing well there, like cardinal methods do well. And there, like, if, uh, say, like, uh, you're getting like 98% of these taken care of, the, the spoiler effect taken care of, it's really thinking of like, okay, well, for this extra little bit at the end, how much complexity do I want to introduce there uh, to, to deal with that little sliver at the end? Um, mm. So that's one of those things where you think, okay, well, like how much complexity do I want to be adding here for this little uh, little bit of, uh, of utility? Uh, and then also thinking like, how much do we want to get hung up on individual components? Um, because like there are all kinds of different 
uh, criteria to use uh, and say, okay, well, um, here's a particular uh, criterion that I think is important. Um, and then thinking, okay, well, um, how does that play in it overall? Whereas like we really want to be thinking about um, maximizing voter happiness, for instance, in terms of selecting a winner. If at the end of the day, uh, for that particular component, that's what we're thinking about. There's talking about maximizing uh, overall ha voter happiness. There are some very technical mathematical questions here regarding what the best measure of aggregate happiness should be. Should it be an arithmetic average, some arithmetic mean utility, or should there be a geometric average utility, like a using a geometric mean uh, to, to introduce possibly more stability uh, into uh, the, the, the choice of, of voting method? Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, well, I mean, when you're doing a model, when you're doing a model and you're trying to think, okay, well, like what voting method does the best, like generally you're thinking about what the utility is for a particular voting method on average. Um, and if you're using something like a geometric mean, like you, it deals a bit better with like more extremes within, um, a data set that you may have. Um, but like, these are like, there are different ways of doing this. So like we have two, um, uh, models that we uh, look at, uh, but it's not to say that these are the only ways of doing these. Um, these models didn't overlap completely. There were uh, differences in terms of what they, they, they got the same kind of general result overall, uh, but they weren't exactly the same. And what that says is that within a model, there are assumptions within that model. There are different ways of, of calculating um, these metrics. Um, so, uh, uh, you, it's unlikely to get too much of a different result, even if you're say using a geometric uh, mean compared to an arithmetic, uh, arithmetic mean. Um, but like there are different ways of doing it. I don't know that yes. it, you get a big difference in terms of results. Okay, uh, another quick question. Someone asked, is a two party system evidence of bad results? Now, uh, related to that, the spoiler effect. So we have Duverger's law, this two party, uh, effect um, is susceptibility to Duverger's law having only two party system. Is that the same thing as measuring just the spoiler effect? So to what degree is a two party system evidence of a bad outcome of an election? There's overlap there between Duverger's law and uh, the concept of the spoiler effect. Um, so Duverger's law, um, he's, he's, he's just saying that um, the voting method that you use can be a predictor for the number of parties uh, that, 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 that carry out. Uh, and he, notice he's saying uh, predictor, so it's not, it's not an absolute rule, despite the misnomer of his law being called a law. Uh, but the, the factors that he's looking at are twofold. Uh, one is the threshold needed to get a particular candidate uh, elected. Uh, and within single winner methods, like it's whoever has the most support. Uh, within a particular uh, um, pool of candidates. Um, and so you can't change that. Like single winner methods, like you need to go to multi-winner methods where using proportional methods in order to lower the threshold for victory uh, for, for that factor. And then the, the second factor for predicting the number of parties um, is whether you can uh, uh, honestly support your honest favorite. Um, and so uh, you're not worrying about throwing away your vote uh, candidates, so new ideas can come into play, and those candidates who are bringing new ideas to the table can get their support reflected. Uh, and so uh, some single winner methods do uh, are able to address that, um, uh, particularly approval voting, uh, the one that we advocate for does a, uh, does a good job at addressing that component and letting you always support your honest favorite candidate. Uh, and so what that says is like, for example, with approval voting, it's not a, a, able to address one factor at all, just by nature of being a single winner method, you'd have to go to multi-winner methods using proportional methods to deal with that. For that second factor, however, it is able to address that, which is always letting you be able to support your, your favorite candidate. So what that says at the end of the day is that for a single winner approval voting method, uh, you probably get more parties if the electorate wanted them, um, but probably not as many as you would with say a proportional method. 
Okay, um, maybe the last question here, because it's getting late, but um, do you think, by the way, if, if anyone has more questions, I guess you can contact Aaron, and Aaron's email is aaron at electionscience.org. Is that correct, Aaron? That's right. All right, so I'll, I'll just put that in the chat. Uh, Aaron's our executive director. And um, so a last question would be, do you think that moving forward with better voting methods, is that prime, how do we get there? Is it primarily a matter of educating the public or do you expect significant pushback from powerful people against a more dynamic democracy? Yeah, I think that that lays out the, the challenge of, of where we are. Um, absolutely, like that, that means educating uh, folks because right now, most people when you tell them uh, use the word voting method, uh, they're going to assume you're, cho you're talking about this choose one method that we're using now. Most people, it's not even on their radar that the voting method is a thing. Uh, and if they are familiar with the term, they are likely not to be aware of uh, very many of their other options. Um, in terms of pushback, um, uh, with what, when we look at, say, like kind of thinking a bit back of the tractability component, um, uh, so far with approval voting, uh, we've uh, um, done well, uh, although with a sample of one in terms of ballot initiatives, uh, we've had, we had minimal uh, pushback uh, over there. Um, and some other uh, uh, elections, uh, there's been a little bit more resistance, uh, often circling around uh, complexity as a rhetorical device uh, for pushing back against a particular voting method after it's already been uh, initiated and then pushing for its repeal. And so as we were talking about um, kind of pushback, one of the ways that we're thinking about is trying to not provide as much ammunition or being able to kind of disarm um, uh, uh, folks who would push away from, from improving different voting methods. And one of the ways that we kind of proactively uh, address this is one by uh, selecting a method that not only does a good job in these important metrics, but is also so, sim so simple that it makes it uh, easier in terms of tractability uh, so that it's, it's difficult to use these kind of simple uh, rhetorical devices and say like, oh, like nobody understands that. Um, so that, that's, that's one way that we deal with that. Okay. Well, um, I, I just want to thank everyone for a very productive uh, discussion and chat. The Center for Election Science, we've got a uh, Discord, we have a, a chat going on at our, we have a Discord server, uh, and that's been posted in this chat. You can contact Aaron, I've posted in the chat also Aaron's email address. Um, my email address is john, J-O-N, at electionscience.org. Uh, but uh, in general, I just want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, please it, keep the chat going. Keep in, in on our at Discord and uh, thank you for pr uh, promoting and better election methods. Please stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to staying in touch in touch with you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron. Hey, um, do we want to before we uh, oh, sign sure. off? Yeah, sure. Go uh, ahead, Aaron. Uh, so there may be uh, a couple of things. One is we've got uh, uh, an article uh, series coming out. Uh, it wasn't originally going to be a series, but then it turned into 27 pages, and then now it is a series. Uh, and so there's a, a kind of a, a, an assessment article that we have going on that compares different voting methods and using uh, factors and applying them to different voting methods. Uh, so uh, if you've got uh, particular questions, you, you may want to hold it on to those questions until after reading that uh, that series that's coming out. Um, and then the other component is, and I'll, I'll let uh, maybe Michael take that one, which is about uh, giving to the Center for Election Science to make sure that we can continue our work. Give to the Center for Election Science so that we can continue doing our work. Um, we've we've made great strides in the last uh, in the last ten years. Um, 10 years? Especially, uh, going on 10, yeah. Especially in the last couple of years. And we're, we, we had a great success in Fargo and we, we're very excited about St. Louis. Um, it, 
voters who will be voting on whether or not to adopt approval voting, whether or not they're going to become the second city in the country to uh, use approval voting in probably November. Yes? Uh, so St. Louis is going to be um, uh, voting on whether to implement approval voting this November, and then we've got Fargo is doing a two-person commission race using a block form of, of approval voting. Next month. Uh, that'll be uh, uh, next month. Um, and it, it looks like someone's also asking when the uh, series is coming up and how they can find it. Uh, so uh, we have a newsletter that you should totally sign up for. Uh, you can sign up for that right off of our site. Um, and then if you look on the uh, part of our website that uh, says news, uh, you'll be able to find out all of our uh, latest articles too. Okay. Um, well, I, again, thank you all and uh, keep, keep up the good work and uh, stay, stay happy and healthy. Thank you very much for everyone's attention here. Take Bye care. everybody, thanks for being here.